Good to go? Okay. Well, thank you for that very generous introduction. It's always strange to hear your own life summed up. Uh, sounds much more impressive summed up than it does to me. Uh, but uh, as uh, Adam said, I did a dissertation on flexional defectiveness, and like many graduate students, I got to the end of the dissertation, and I never wanted to think about it ever again. <laughs> uh, so I went away and I did some other stuff for a while, worked on a variety of other morphological phenomena, and actually I've now cycled myself back around to it uh, in the form of this book that'll be coming out. And so today I'm going to talk to you about some new and some old work on inflectional defectiveness that I've been doing. Are we okay? Okay. <laughs> and. Uh, Specifically, I chose this title, Defectiveness as Allomorphy, How the Idiosyncratic Fringes of Inflection Are Not So Idiosyncratic After All. Uh, and we'll see what I mean by that, but I won't really be talking about the allomorphy part until the end. OK. So here is uh, a rather famous statement about the relationship between uh, grammar and lexicon. The lexicon is incredibly boring by its very nature. Those objects that it does contain are there because they fail to conform to interesting laws. The lexicon is like a prison. It contains only the lawless, and the only thing its inmates have in common is lawlessness. OK. Uh, so this is a view that makes a really sharp distinction between things that are regular and things that are idiosyncratic, okay, and assigns them off to very separate domains, where idiosyncratic can mean non-productive, idiosyncratic can also mean, for example, exhibiting properties of not well-behaved morphology, of criminal morphology, so to speak. Uh, so well-behaved morphology exhibits productivity, for example, uh, and structural isomorphism in this view between syntactic and morphological structure is also often assumed as a property of well-behaved morphological systems. So uh, here's a rather bold, uh, more bold than often statement. Uh, words don't exist. They're the phlogiston of linguistics. Uh, this is sort of news to me as a morphologist, but okay. Uh, everyone must say that sentences are built out of morphemes, and the part I want you to focus on, we expect a high degree of isomorphism of the type expressed by Baker's mirror generalization, although various affixal properties lead to readjustment rules that end up masking syntactic structures. Okay. So this is uh, certainly not the only view, but this is a common view of what's out there in morphology. Uh, that assigns uh, lexicon and morphology as very different domains, okay, uh, or even distributes morphology out to lexicon, to syntax, and to other areas, and doesn't even necessarily consider morphology to be its own domain. But that makes a sharp distinction between what is irregular and oddball and the fringes, and what is good morphology, okay. Um, I'm going to argue for a very different view. Okay. And I'm not the first person to make this argument by a long stretch. There's sort of a, been a big building sense of the problematic idea, uh, the problems associated with making such a sharp distinction between grammar and lexicon. But I'm going to pick out a case that I think is particularly interesting in this regard, which is paradigmatic gaps. OK. So a paradigmatic gap is the lack of any word form where we expect to find some word form. So uh, here's the audience participation moment to get us warmed up a little bit. Think about the verb forego. For those of you that are native English speakers or even not native English speakers, uh, you know, I decided yesterday to forgo dessert. I actually didn't. We had wonderful pie and ice cream for dessert. But you know, we can imagine. Okay, so I decided to forgo the, the infinitival form is perfectly fine and well formed. Uh, imagine now you're going to turn that into an actual morphological past tense. Yesterday I dessert. Okay, what did you do? For went, I hear a bunch of. Anybody want to offer something else? I hear some foregoed. Okay, now here's the question. So those are the two logical possibilities. So we've got undergo, underwent, and go went. So uh, forego for went is a very logical possibility. Uh, undergoed would obviously be the regularization of the verb. How many of you feel comfortable and would use either of those forms? One, two, three, four, four. Five people, six people out of maybe at least 30, 40 people in the room. Okay. How many of you would 
opt out to I decided to forego. <laughs> Most of you. Okay, that's the point here. So this is something that's on the edge of being a gap. It's sort of it's a little bit gradient in English. It has clear underpinnings in this competition between the regularized pattern and the irregular pattern. Um, and it, if you go and you actually look at the usage patterns, you find that overwhelmingly people do not use a past tense form. Uh, past tense in the British National Corpus comes to something like 0.1% of total lexeme use, which is really, really low for a past tense form. Underwent, for example, comes in at about 22%. <laughs> okay, so that's really, really low. Speakers are, are largely avoiding that. Now, so that's English, and that's sort of one example of the possibilities. But when you get into other languages, these can become much more conventionalized than the patterns are in English. So a very famous one is the Russian first-person singular verbs, of which there are about 100. And here's what they look like. So in Russian, uh, the three persons, two numbers, in what I'm going to call the non-past tense, you might hear me. That has to do with aspect stuff. You can think of it as present or future. It doesn't really matter for our purposes. Uh, and you can see that there are usually six very well-formed forms to go with that. However, for this verb to win or to be victorious, speakers avoid the first person singular like it's the plague. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about it is that, first of all, uh, it is definitely syntactically OK. Um, you can say, I will be victorious. Except if you often ask Russian speakers, they'll often say it's impolite to say that. There's sort of this rhetoric around why they won't say it. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be right because, among other things, you can say, I will be victorious in a totally different way, and it's not impolite at all. So it doesn't seem to be social convention about bragging. Uh, the second thing is that, like forego, the, the first person singular of Russian Pabyedit seems to have had in its history competition between two forms, one of which was of the Church Slavonic origin, one of which was a native Russian origin. Uh, and the, in competition between these forms, as the Church Slavonic version was falling out of use the, and the native Russian was taking over, it seems to have been in conflict with the very Church Slavonic salient root, and speakers just stopped using it. <laughs> okay. Third thing that's interesting, the native Russian variant has completely taken over. It's used with lots of church Slavonic forms in the first person singular. It, there's no good reason in the modern language to think that that form is problematic. And yet speakers still don't use it. Okay, so it's very conventionalized in a way that the one for forgo isn't quite in English. And it's these kind of conventionalized ones that seem to be very lexically specific and learned from generation to generation as defective that are particularly interesting to me and that I'm going to focus on primarily. Okay, let me stop and say at this moment, can everybody hear me in the back? Am I projecting outwards enough? Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm, I know I'm like eight minutes into the talk. It's a bad time to ask that, but better late than never. OK, so this is the phenomenon that I'm going to be really interested in. And the reason that I'm interested in it, particularly today, is that if we take this view that non-productive structures are assigned to the lexicon and must be lexically specified, um, they tend to be treated as superficial scars on the face of morphological systems. <laughs> okay? That they are treated as being outside of the grammar. They are something that sort of gets readjusted after all the interesting morphology has happened. Uh, and paradigmatic gaps also represent an extreme example of non-isomorphism between syntax and morphology. They are literally where the syntax needs something and the morphology does not provide it. Okay? And therefore, it fully crashes the syntax. Uh, so no inflectional form corresponding to some well-formed syntactic structure. In other words, paradigmatic gaps are seemingly a textbook case for the need to distinguish between grammar and lexicon. And they have been noted as such by, for example, Halley, 1973, who suggested that the gram grammar produces the forms. He was particularly interested in these first-person singular Russian ones. And the grammar produces the forms perfectly productively. And then you have a lexically specified filter that says, no lexical insertion, and, and just removes that one as an ad hoc, completely ad hoc exception. Uh, Organ and Sprouse in 1999 offered what's essentially a a theoretical updating of that idea in optimality theoretic form, where they argue that there is a component that operates 
after eval, okay, after evaluation, that uh, removes things that are gaps and causes absolute failures. Uh, you might imagine, you can easily imagine that paradigmatic gaps cause much discussion in optimality theory for the idea that how do you get something to absolutely fail. Okay, so this was their solution. You do something after the grammar happens to pull those out. That to me makes it very interesting because I'm going to actually suggest that paradigmatic gaps are both in the lexicon and they're in the morphology. That they, I'm going to start with the morphology part. That they exhibit properties that are very, in very traditional, formal, morphological terms, indicative of being in the grammar. Okay, specifically, I'm going to suggest that there are sort of feeding and bleeding type relationships between gaps and other kinds of allomorphy, other kinds of morphological patterns. Notice I'm sliding in there the first idea that defectiveness, paradigmatic gaps are basically allomorphs in some sense. Okay. Uh, and so they really bridge this divide. Now, if I'd been better at PowerPoint, uh, I would have actually tried to blend the colors in here in together to give us the sense of the uh, loose boundary between the two. Uh, PowerPoint didn't want to behave, but you can imagine the blending that should exist there. Okay. All right. So let me see where I am time-wise. Done. Okay. Doing okay. All right. So as I said, I'm far from the first person to suggest that we need to stage a jailbreak, so to speak, okay, and take the lexicon as more than just a random list of lawless stuff. Uh, and my, in my own perspective, I come from sort of two side-by-side uh, -side traditions that operate partially in tandem but partially in parallel. So the formal word and paradigm literature has uh, several decades now of work arguing that words or constructions are the level at which form is associated to meaning. This is an amorphous approach in the word of Steven Anderson. Okay. Uh, also arguing that morphological organization involves both a syntagmatic and a paradigmatic dimension. The paradigmatic will come in a bit. Uh, and that productivity and regularity are gradient. And in parallel to that, there's a tradition of thought arguing that regular inflected word forms and constructions are in the lexicon, not just irregularly inflected things, but that we can find uh, cognitive evidence for regular ones too. Uh, the lexicon is organized around a richly structured associative network, which is to say a paradigmatic dimension, and that productivity and regularity are emergent. <laughs> yeah, I see you rolling your eyes at me. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. I have to sl I slide in some of these things while I can. Okay. So uh, look, I'm going to look a little bit at these two together, and I'm going to sort of suggest that I'm going to sort of look a little bit from a formal side, and then I'm going to look a little bit more from a somewhat more cognitive side, doing some uh, modeling and simulation computational stuff. Okay. All right. So here we go into defectiveness, quote, in the grammar, but still lexicalized. So still lexically specific, but in, in exhibiting interactions of the kind that are conventionally associated with rule, grammar, grammar rule interaction. Okay, there, I got it out. All right, so this is going to be a run through some interactions here real quick. But I'm going to get some water before I do. All right. So I'm going to look at three kinds of patterns of interaction. So uh, an interesting and to many people surprising thing is that defectiveness actually interacts with syncretism. So syncretism is homophony between inflected forms. So it's uh, two syntactically distinct grammatical sets of properties that have one form associated with them. And we get interactions between this and defectiveness. And logically, there are three kinds of possible interaction. So we can see here in the top left, the idea of defectiveness overriding syncretism is that there is some set of cells here represented by class B that, and the lack of a border between the two that are syncretic with each other here too and there. They have the same form, but when defectiveness overrides syncretism, there is a pattern of defectiveness that is specified with regard to some set of morphosyntactic properties. And those cells are defective even where one of them is normally syncretic with something else. But the cell it's syncretic with is not defective. Okay, so the pink is the defectiveness, if you're getting that. 
uh, syncretism overriding defectiveness would be where there is, again, some pattern of defectiveness specified with some set of more syntactic properties, uh, but where that to be defective is not. Okay. Defectiveness following the distribution of syncretism is sort of the opposite of that, right? It's that there's this specified with regard to some set of properties, and where there's a pattern of syncretism, they're both defective. Okay? Turns out, yes, we get all three of those. Uh, I have collected about 10 or so different kinds of examples. I'm going give to give you the three that are not necessarily the best, but are the easiest to explain and talk format. Uh, in not requiring too many forms to be put up there and too much exegesis. So uh, we're going to look at the Russian genitive plural, which is of this type, the Icelandic imperatives, which are of that type, and the Greek genitive plural, which is of this type. All right, so let's look at those. Uh, those of you who know Russian may know that Zoshenko, in a, pay, in an, a short story written in the 1940s, spoofed uh, Russian bureaucracy by uh, with a story called The Fire Poker, uh, Kachirga, uh, which was uh, spoofing the fact that the genitive plural in Russian is required by the number five, and yet this noun does not have a genitive plural. So the bureaucrats had to find a way around this to not show their idiocy, okay, and their ignorance is the point of the story. I've got a quote later if you want to see it uh, after the talk. Uh, but the point is that there's this gap in the genitive plural on this noun, the fire poker, and this does seem to have something to do with form predictability. So the genitive plural would be expected to have a zero ending. That would force stress back onto the stem. There are some that do this well, but it's notable that all the ones of this type have that un relatively unusual pattern in Russian of having uh, stress on the stem only in the fo one form of the genitive plural. So there's something about the form here, but it's also clearly very lexicalized. There are ones that do this without any problem. Now, for our purposes, what's really interesting is actually a pattern of syncretism. So in Russian, this is an inanimate noun, so the nominative and the accusative have the same form as each other in the plural. They're syncretic. But those of you that know Russian know that in animates, it's actually the accusative and the genitive that have the same form as each other. Okay, So this is another noun that is also defective in the same way. Uh, you can see that the genitive plural is missing. Uh, however, the accusative plural, which has the same form as the genitive plural, is perfectly fine. Okay, That's a little strange. Okay, So there's our first example. That is uh, defectiveness overriding syncretism. Oh, yeah, and there's the one to pay attention to. OK, Icelandic. Uh, Icelandic imperatives are formed with some kind of coronal suffix. I'm following very closely here the analysis of Hansen 1999. Uh, so some kind of coronal suffix, which he analyzes as one uh, suffix with two input allomorphs. That's not particularly important for our purposes, but that I follow his analysis. And then there's this clitic pronoun. So you can see that these are sort of normal examples. Uh, there's also this fact of devoicing of the sonorant, so stems ending in a sonorant plus a coronal obstruent devoice the sonorant in the imperative. So, you know, there's the stem, here's the imperative, there's the clitic form, and it doesn't align quite correctly on this computer, but you can see that there's the devoicing of the sonorant there. Okay. Uh, as another fact you need to know, as elsewhere in Germanic, Icelandic verbs can be strong or weak in the past tense. So uh, strong ones have an out-loud alternation. Weak ones have this same coronal suffix. And he argues very strongly that it is, in fact, the same one, that this is a syncretism, or at least a partial syncretism. The fact that I'm sort of hiding here is that there's also potentially an out-loud alternation in some forms, but it's the same coronal suffix in the weak ones. Uh, and if there is sonorant devoicing in the imperative, it also occurs in the weak past. That gives us evidence that there is, in fact, a systematic pattern of syncretism there. And actually, there's also, even in some exceptional cases, we'll see in a sec, uh, also exceptional devoicing, that if it happens in the imperative, it also happens in the past tense exceptionally. So there clearly is some sort of systematic rule of imperative past tense syncretism in weak verbs. Now, the generalization about defectiveness is that in a particular subset of stems, uh, uh, L and N stems, long L and N stems, the imperative 
has gaps in verbs that do not exhibit imperative past tense syncretism. Okay. So uh, you, these are some examples. No, with or without, uh, with the sonorant devoicing or without it, it doesn't matter. The imperative uh, is bad uh, because these are ones with strong past tense forms. Uh, however, when you have weak past tense forms of the same type with the same irregular sonorant devoicing, they, okay, with irregular sonorant devoicing, you have a perfectly well-formed past tense, okay, and a well-formed imperative. Okay, so what this seems to be the case is that the existence of syncretism between imperative and past tense is saving this subset of forms from being defective and not saving those because they don't have the syncretism. Okay, so that is the uh, syncretism, syncretism overriding defectiveness. Okay. Third pattern, genitive plural of Greek nouns. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff around these. They, again, like the other two, actually seem to have some issues associated with predictability of the form. So there's a morphophonological uncertainty thing going on. But they're also, I argue, lexicalized. And we find effectiveness in the genitive plural in three places, three classes. So represented by these three classes. And what's particular about them, you can see, is that they actually may or may not have a stress pattern that is exhibited here by the word for C, thalassa, where you get thalasson, okay, uh, that doesn't occur elsewhere. <laughs> um, and there is uncertainty about whether this stress alternation applies, but in this class it definitely applies if it applies only in the genitive plural. Okay, now I think you can predict where this is going. There is another class with syncretism. <laughs> along the stress dimension, not total syncretism in this case, where you get the stress shift, the same stress shift in the genitive singular and in the genitive plural, and there is a class that is otherwise exactly the same as it that is defective in both the genitive singular and in the genitive plural. So this would be defectiveness following the pattern of syncretism. Okay? We can see this as a uh, defectiveness that is generalized according to the genitive plural, but then spreads to the genitive singular in a class that has syncretism. Okay. As I said, only along the stress dimension, but that's the idea. OK, so there it is all summed up for you that we get all three kinds of patterns of interaction. And notice that in, uh, I talk about these in sort of trying to talk about these in sort of theory neutral terms, but these are the kinds of patterns that, at least in sort of classic generative morphology and phonology, uh, which was still in vogue when I was still taking my earliest linguistics classes, we would talk about these as feeding and bleeding and counterfeeding and counterbleeding relationships. And were sort of classic examples of rule interaction. And I'd argue that they are still rule interaction, even if that terminology has gone somewhat out of vogue. Uh, so the idea here is that we get kinds of interactions. It's difficult to adequately accommodate these patterns to the idea that syncretism is rule governed, but defectiveness is not. Okay. The nature of the interaction suggests that we need to jointly account for syncretism and defectiveness. And I've specifically given you patterns of syncretism that are very robust and clearly systematic in the languages. So we don't want to slough off syncretism to the lexicon or to some area outside the grammar. We want to pull defectiveness in is the idea. Um, and this suggests that defectiveness should be accounted for within the core grammar itself. I'm going to give you just a tiny bit a very tiny bit of what that might look like, for example, just to give you a sense of where the formal side of the analysis is. OK. So here I'm going to take as my jumping off point some rather interesting work by Greg Stump in 2006 and 2010. Uh, this is mostly his brilliance on the formal side, and then I got to piggyback a little bit on it. All right, so the idea here is that there are, in fact, two levels of morphosyntactic feature structure. Uh, this uh, idea that the features represented by the syntax and the features in the morphology are not fully the same as each other is instantiated in many theories in many different ways. I think that there are different ways that this could be implemented. So this is only one particular implementation of a much broader idea. But this particular formulation is that there's a mapping from cells that have syntactically determined morphosyntactic properties and lexemes two cells that have morphologically determined features and stems. 
Okay, so this is determined by the workings of the syntax. This is determined by the contrast that the morphology makes. Syncretism is a case where the morphology fails to make a contrast, therefore you're going to have a single cell in essence at that morphological level as compared to at the syntactic level. All right, and the idea is that by default you get a one-to-one -one mapping that you have a function that applies to transform a lexeme and set of syntactic properties into a stem and a set of morphological properties. Uh, uh, so this can be formalized into where uh, sigma encompasses tau, a paradigm function uh, over lexeme and tau is definable as the paradigm function over stem and sigma. Okay, just to give you a little bit. For those of you that yearn for that formalism, here's a tiny, tiny bit of it. Uh, all right, so now looking to the, the cases that we have for the interactions between defectiveness and syncretism that we've seen, one way you can think about this is specifying restrictions on the mapping between the two levels according to one level or the other. Okay? So for example, we could specify that where sigma encompasses tau, uh, the paradigm function of a lexeme and tau is definable as the paradigm function of a stem and set of properties, except where tau encompasses genitive plural. Okay. Why does that get us? What it gets us is the idea that, remember, this is the case where the genitive plural is defective and the accusative plural is not. What it gets us is a way to say, this combination that is syntactically defined is not well formed. Okay. However, the accusative plural, which maps to actually the same cell the genitive plural would be expected to map to, is perfectly well defined. Okay? Because they're syntactically distinct but morphologically united, you can specify a restriction at the level of the syntactic properties and leave the morphology alone to operate by itself. Okay? Uh, which helps with the fact that in, if you were to assume a directional syncretism, actually you would have to say that the accusative is dependent on the genitive. And when the genitive is defective, that's going to cause you some trouble. This is a nice way to pull that apart and let the morphology continue to have that dependency between the accusative and the genitive and still get your syntax to work out for you with the gap. Okay, so that's just one example. Uh, the idea is that when defectiveness overrides syncretism, you specify at the tau level, so at the syntactic properties level. When defectiveness follows syncretism, you're going to actually specify that at the sigma level, at the morphology level, because you want to capture that there is united morphological behavior. They're both defective. Okay? So you want to capture that essentially defectiveness is piggybacking on syncretism. And then when syncretism overrides defectiveness, you do a specification at both levels sort of jointly. Okay, I know that's sort of a run through. I've got a lot of things that I want to cover. Uh, and so I'm not going to go deeper into that, but it gives you some sense of how I'm thinking about this interaction formal terms and what I mean when I say that we should bring defectiveness into the core part of the grammar. Okay. All right. Now let's look from the other end. <laughs> defectiveness in the lexicon, but I'm going to argue that in the lexicon is not to be associated with being a superficial scar on the system at all. Medium good. All right. So this is now going to be a different data set, and we'll pull them together at the end. And I'm going to look at a different piece of the puzzle of defectiveness, essentially, uh, and look at it as a learning problem. So remember I told you that those Russian first-person singular gaps used to have good grammar internal motivation for them. Uh, seems to have caused an active pattern of avoidance by speakers, but then the, that motivation, that cause was lost from the system and yet the gaps just kept right on going. So one of the things we have to face is this question of how do paradigmatic gaps persist after their original causes are no longer relevant in the language, after they can no longer be treated as sort of epiphenomenal of a grammar conflict, uh, how, which is to say how are lexicalized paradigmatic gaps learned. Um, you can think about this if you want to connect to what we were just saying. You can think about those that licensing between the two levels of feature structure as being probabilistic, okay? and then asking how do people learn the probability of the existence of that mapping. Okay? That's sort of how I think of it. 
Uh, and a big thanks here to my collaborators, Robert Deland and Janet Pierre Humber. This is sort of old work that is now getting dusted off and revitalized and pushed forward some. And I'm very grateful to them. OK, so we're going to again look at those Russian first person singular gaps that we started with. This is a slightly different example. It actually has the same historic root, but this is convince. So speakers avoid like the plague, saying, I will convince you for whatever reason, right? Uh, and the interesting thing to me about this pattern, something I haven't told you yet, is that it's very morphophonologically defined. So it occurs only in the second conjugation class. The traditional description is two conjugation classes, first and second, and occurs only in the second. And within that, it occurs only in the subclass that have dental consonants at the end of the stem. Uh, and these are uh, ones that have an alternation, so they're a more distinct morphophonological type. Speakers have to attend to that final consonant to successfully learn morphological behavior. Uh, so I assume that they are quite salient. And most interestingly, within that class of dental stems, if you drill down, it turns out that there is something of a center uh, periphery pattern going on where the ones that have D as the stem final consonant, like Ubiedit does, uh, about 12.4% of those are defective. Okay, these are counts taken from a sampling of the Russian national corpus, okay, a big dump of verbs from the corpus. Uh, if you go out by phonological feature distance, it goes down. So the next highest is uh, the difference between stop and fricative. And then the next beyond that is the difference between voicing Right? And then as you go out, you go down. So there seems to be something about a prototypicality effect, where the center is the ones that are D. And then as you go outwards in distance in the neighborhood, you get reductions in the number of gaps. So this is something we want to try to model and understand why there is this center periphery kind of idea. All right, so the approach to this is going to be in terms of Bayesian inference, basically arguing that morphosyntactic learning here is Bayesian inference. And the idea is relatively simple, I think. Uh, so this is, these are counts from the Russian national corpus of this verb. These are counts from a few years ago. Uh, but you can see that only about 0.2% of the first person singular forms, i.e. one item of the 453 that were in the corpus, are first person singular. That compares, if you take a big sample of, I think this was about 800 verbs, uh, that you will usually get a total averaging around 12.9%. So that's a big difference. So the first thing to think about is that learners infer the relative absence is a property of ubiedit by observation. Okay, that if we assume that speakers can attend to the relative frequencies of the different inflected forms, and there is evidence to believe that speakers do attend to the relative frequency of forms, then simple observ with, with enough observations, you should be able to attend to the fact that this pattern is different from that pattern, and thereby infer defectiveness. Okay, that's actually the really easy part to figure out. The harder part to model is actually what you do with a verb like kudyesi to do magic. You can imagine this is not a highly frequent verb. Um, and in fact, how do, but speakers nonetheless treat it as defective. How do they do that? How do they learn that pattern? And the argument here is essentially going to be lexical neighbors, which is to say analogy. Okay, that there's a kind of analogy happening, uh, and we can figure out what kind of information they need. Uh, to do that. All right, so uh, here's Bayes' theorem, okay? Very simple. So the idea here is that P of H is the prior probability of a hypothesis in the hypothesis space. So I'm going to assume that the hypothesis space is simply every distribution you've ever heard, okay? Uh, maximally broad. And each of those hypotheses, each of those distributions, by which I mean, say, this distribution, Okay, across the six forms, uh, is going to be assigned a prior probability, uh, which is to say it's probability before you have observed data. And that's going to be determined based on the behavior of your lexical neighbors. So some subset of items that are close to you uh, in the lexicon are going to be used. Uh, technically, we're going to do KL divergence across the two uh, uh, distributions to determine the difference between the two. And that's going to be used to weight and determine the probability of each of those hypotheses. So in other words, 
of h in this, in this calculation can be interpreted as the analogical influence of neighbors on some target item. So if you're trying to estimate ubiedi, this is the things that are like ubiedi, what kind of influence do they have? Uh, then it's going to be balanced against actual observed data. The probability of the observed data given a hypothesis in the hypothesis space is the other part of the formula up here on the top. Uh, and so the idea is the more data you have, the less you are dependent on the behavior of your neighbors to determine your own morphological behavior. And the less data you have, the more you're dependent on the behavior of your neighbors to determine your behavior. Okay. Uh, fairly simple. I think that those are not radical assumptions in any way, shape, or form. Uh, P of D, the probability of the data, we don't actually care because we're going to compare hypotheses for the same target item. And since the t target item always is the same data, that just washes out of the system and we can ignore it. All right. So we're trying to estimate it, the probability of a hypothesis given the data. This is very basic Bayesian inference stuff. We're going to run this under uh, eight conditions. I don't know why I'm saying we are going to. I have run this under eight conditions, and I'm going to show it to you. Uh, four an analogical strength conditions. So we're going to weight the pro prior probability of the hypothesis by a constant, which I'll call beta, which will determine the relative strength of analogy versus observation. As beta goes up, the influence of neighbors goes up relative to the weight of data. Uh, and then, so we're going to give you four betas, and then two neighborhood conditions. So what, how do you determine what's your neighborhood is the question here. In one, uh, the null hypothesis is you're just going to randomly grab 300 lexemes that you've heard, and that's the neighborhood for a given lexical item that you're trying to estimate the behavior of. Uh, and all 300 of those are equally probable uh, and equally influential. That's obviously not a very good model of the lexicon. We know that things that are more similar influence each other more. So the other condition is going to be a weighted condition where the uh, stem final consonant of the verb, this thing that we saw drives this prototypicality effect, will be used and will be weighted. So things that are more similar to the target in that stem final consonant will get more weight in determining the prior probability of each hypothesis in the hypothesis space. So there's your eight conditions once you put the four and the two together. And the idea here is that manipulating analogical strength and neighborhood composition is a way to test the effect of the distribution of forms in the lexicon on learnability. In other words, what does the distribution of forms by itself, irrespective of any original conditioning factors, but the fact that they're clustered in the lexicon, is that doing work to help people learn defectiveness? OK. Uh, and of course, we're not modeling, as in all sorts of simulation work and stuff, we're not actually modeling what we think people are necessarily actually doing. What we're testing is checking for plausibility to the extent that the input data and the assumptions of the model are plausible. It gives a way to show how it could be learned, but it's not necessarily how it is actually learned. I always feel the need to give the caveat. OK. So we're going to embed this in a. Uh, agent-based network. So basically, there are two types of agents. You can think of the black ones here as the adults and the white ones as the children. Uh, and the adults talk, they say a million verbs each. The children listen. This is obviously an idealized world in which children take in and hear everything adults say and remember it perfectly. Uh, perhaps not so realistic, but this is the way it works uh, for us. At the end of each generational cycle, the adults die having fulfilled their evolutionary role here. Uh, the children learn grammar, which is to say that they apply this Bayesian learning mechanism for every verb that they have heard. And they're taking, they're taking uh, neighborhoods independently for each individual one. And you know, each one has its own data. And each agent has its own lexicon. Uh, and then they mature, and they reproduce, and they have new children. We run it out for generations. Uh, the speech of new adults is based on the grammar that they learn. So there's no guarantee that there's going to be a replication of what they heard in what they say, because it's mediated by this learning process. Uh, there's going to be 10 generations, 50 adults and 50 children per generation. We have not yet begun looking seriously at social structuring. So it's just a random network, which is also not that great of a model of social structure. But we're interested more in the learning mechanism part rather than the social dissemination part. And 
perhaps being foolishly naive, we decided to do the simplest possible thing uh, with regard to the input data, which is that we dumped out a bunch of the Russian national corpus into the model and nothing else. So anything that was in the Russian national corpus is only verbs, but any verb structures that were in the Russian national corpus, any patterning that was in there, any distributions and similarities and clustering in the lexicon that was there has a possibility of being picked up, but we didn't manipulate the data in any way on the input, so we tried to get what is the best, most realistic data we have. It's not ideal, again, about child language input, but I think it's still pretty good. It's very messy, okay? And I mean that in the best possible way. Okay, results. Uh, so what you see is these are the four beta conditions. This is if this might be too small to read, but that's 8, 16, 32, and 64. So this is the least influence of, analog of analogy. This is the most influence of analogy. Okay, um, and then within each graph, the solid line is the weighted condition where more similar neighbors have more influence on targets. And the dotted line is where a random subset of neighbors has influence on the target. And what we're doing here is, on the x-axis, running out the 10 generations and then asking how many defective verbs there are in any given generation. And what you can see fairly easily is, first of all, that increasing analogical influence decreases the number of gaps. Okay, it pushes down the number of defective items. That's actually a really good effect because that means that you are getting regression to the mean, which is what you should get. You don't want defectiveness running rampant through your system. Uh, that would cause, say, Russian to fail to have any verbs quickly. <laughs> Not what we're looking for. Uh, and you can see that in some of the lo low analogical conditions, we are getting generational increase in a way that is not actually a good model. When we get to beta equals 32, that's where we have sort of the moderate level of analogical influence gets us some generational stability. Okay, and that's sort of important. We want to look into that property more. The second thing to notice is, of course, that there's this big gap in each graph between the morphophonologically weighted and the randomly weighted condition. In other words, uh, your neighbors help if they're more like you. Okay? Having neighbors that are similar to each other, influence each other, uh, increases the rate of defectiveness. It is helping to facilitate and stabilize patterns of defectiveness. Okay, so that's sort of neat. Uh, yeah. Since I assume you're starting with the same input for all of them. Right. So is it the case that just on the very first generation when you have the internal pair and the neighborhood weighted that you just lose a big chunk of them and lose it? Is that where you, why do you have the different the first generation? Why do I have the general okay. Um, yeah, you lose a big chunk of them immediately. Uh, so, right, right. And so th there is actually implicitly one generation to the left of this, which is the Russian national corpus itself. <laughs> and in that, they're obviously the exact same number because it hasn't yet applied any learning mechanism. So if I put it up here on the left, it would be like, okay, it's here, and then it diverges quickly to that and that. So yeah, so once you lose those weak ones, it stabilizes more or less, but the loss immediately is quick. Yeah, okay, does that help? Okay, good. All right, yeah, feel free to stop me with clarificational questions at least, uh, although I say that now almost to the end. But all right, so here we're looking, here the graphs look the same, but the x-axis has changed, so I point this out. Uh, now we're looking at how once a gap is a gap, once a verb is counted as defective, and I could tell you more later about how I count things as defective. You might be wondering that. I'm sort of glossing over some of the details. But um, how long is it a gap? How many generations does it persist? How many generations across the 10? How many generations does it get counted as defective? So that's what we're counting now on the x-axis. Okay? And then y is, again, number of verbs that fit that lifetime in this case. So we can see that there are a lot of verbs that have lifetimes of 10 generations. It goes down as analogical influence goes up, but in all of them, there's a relatively strong number that persist all 10 generations. 
those are ones, this will be clearer when I show you frequency, but those are the ones that are high enough frequency that they are not really dependent on their neighbors, that the data is strong enough that you get purely word-specific learning. The rest of them, you can see that there is in general this pattern where there are a lot of things that are of short lifetimes and not many things that are of long lifetimes once you take out 10. Okay, lifetime goes down. Uh, but the most interesting part of this, I think, is actually that in, when you get to the middle analogical influence conditions, you start to get a divergence between the morphophonologically weighted condition and the randomly weighted condition. So you can see here that the, there are, the slopes are quite different, right? where you're getting promotion of gaps of short lifetime in that morphophonologically weighted condition that you don't get in the randomly weighted condition, which is to say you're getting items being drawn in. These are not all in generation one. They actually occur fairly evenly through the model. You're getting items being drawn into the neighborhood of defectives, at least briefly. And then some of them, the randomness of attestation patterns, they get dropped out again, okay? But that it's really doing its work down here in the short lifetime space. Okay, this is the same kind of thing, except now I'm only giving you that that I'm only giving you this condition, but I'm breaking it out by frequency of the quartile frequency. So the first quartile is the top quarter of items in terms of total lexeme frequency, and then working our way down to the lowest. And what you can see is uh, not too surprisingly in the that highest frequency quartile, uh, there actually is very little difference between the two. And in fact, you probably can't tell, but there are, are actually error bars on all of these dots. They're just so small that you can't, they can't actually be highly distinguished from the bars themselves, uh, from the point dots themselves. But some of them actually do overlap, especially down in here. So which is to say, word-specific learning, not surprisingly, the two different kinds of neighborhoods don't really matter when you don't depend on your neighborhood at all. But interestingly, in the second quartile and the third quartile, basically in the random condition, you can't get defectiveness. It just gets dumped out of the model, it's gone. You can only preserve defectives in this group. Uh, this one is absolutely at zero, so is that one. Uh, but in the weighted condition, that's where the work is being done. So it's being, defectiveness is being promoted in the middle range of the frequency spectrum. Okay, that's where the lexicon is doing work. Okay, so within the model, how am I doing that? Okay. Uh, we get increased strength of analogy that decreases, oh sorry, increased strength of analogy decreases both the number of gaps in a generation and the lifetime of gaps. However, morphophonological weighting of neighbors, so in other words, sensitivity to the structure of the lexicon increases both the number of gaps and their average lifetime. And that weighting especially is true uh, the effect is especially true for lower frequency verb, mid-range frequency verbs, although not very, very low ones. So implications for the real world gaps suggest that Russian first person singular gaps are a self-reinforcing pattern. The fact that they happened by the fate of history to be morphophonologically clustered takes over as a way that they can persist and be learned and be facilitated, okay? Uh, through uh, time, even in the absence of those original conditions. Uh, the density, therefore, is crucial to learnability, I suggest, and thus the persistence of the first person singular gaps. And this is actually something that should be well familiar to many of you, which is this is essentially a lexical gang effect. This is the same kind of thing we find with, say, English past tenses that are not the ED pattern, <laughs> okay, where you get you know, the hit, hit type, for example, uh, and lots of ones, the sing-sang type, uh, that have this sort of morphophonological effect where the clustering the lexicon is crucial. And that, therefore, defective, uh, an implication, I didn't point this out really earlier, but notice that in that hypothesis space, all of those hypotheses, some are essentially defective hypotheses, uh, hypotheses of defectiveness, and some are hypotheses are not, and by putting them into the same space, we're letting defective and non-defective patterns compete directly against each other, okay, in this Bayesian algorithm, and therefore, 
essentially, we're treating defectiveness as a productive kind of pattern to the extent that it gets learned and modestly extended. And actually, in the history of Russian, we know that it has been modestly extended because there's a verb, plisosit, for example, which is a vacuum, uh, which could not have been one of the original gaps because vacuum had not yet been invented at the time that the problems that caused the gaps had already disappeared. It must therefore have been created on this sort of analogical pattern. And so that's good, actually. We want to model very weak defectiveness, which is also a pattern that's a lexical gang type pattern. OK. Uh, looking at the clock, I think I'm going to just sort of run through this. So the overarching theme for me here is that morphology is by its v very nature frequently idiosyncratic, and that words that deviate from syntax morphology isomorphism are just as normal as ones that adhere to it, and in fact can be very revealing of what's going on. And I think defectiveness to me is interesting because it's the absolute extreme version of that. It's about as idiosyncratic and oddball as you can get. Uh, and that non-productivity informs our understanding of the workings just as much as productivity does, and that the morphology and lexicon are intertwined, and that really what we should be looking at is pushing the two themes together. Defectiveness is part of the grammar, and defectiveness as emergent from the lexicon are not really saying different things. OK, so I promised you something about defectiveness as allomorphy. And here's sort of the last words. Paradigmatic gaps can participate in fleeting and bleeding type relationships with non-defective allomorphs. Okay? In other words, the interactions are the kind of interactions we find among between allomorphs generally. Paradigmatic gaps can exhibit morphophonological stem selection. So in Russian, the gaps affect only a morphophonologically defined subset of lexemes. That's also very typical of allomorphs, that they have stem selection. Uh, gaps can exhibit weak productivity akin to the weak productivity of irregular lexical gangs. Okay? That's also something that we often find of allomorphic patterns. And, and the list would go on and on. If you let me talk for four more hours, I could give you six more of these. But the point here is not exactly to say that gaps are allomorphs in a very strict sense, but that by flipping our assumptions about gaps being outside of the grammar and being anomalous, by sort of taking that as a question to be investigated, except for the fact that it is a case where the syntax fails because the morphology prevails to provide something, in all other respects, gaps seem to basically operate like allomorphs. They operate, therefore, within the grammar in much the same way. And that's sort of the punchline. So conclusions. Uh, gaps are not superficial scars. They actually exhibit many properties of normal morphological objects. However far you want to push that idea, there is good empirical backing to at least some of that. Uh, suggests that gaps are in the grammar, suggests that they are also in the lexicon, but that we should think of that as a dynamic, pervasive, self-reinforcing pattern that is emergent from the lexicon. And ultimately, while gaps are highly idiosyncratic, I at least find the nature of that idiosyncratic idiosyncrasy to be highly informative. Thank you. Okay, Mike. <laughs>